Welcome to the Western Vowel podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of this series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled, Not What Should Be, But What Is. The talk was given by Regina Sarah Ryan on October 3rd, 2020, via Zoom. Regina is the editor of Home Press, a workshop leader, retreat guide, and author of The Woman Awake, Igniting the Inner Life, Praying Dangerously, only God, and other books. If there is benefit in the talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Regina Sarah Ryan. So thank you all for coming tonight. Some of you not knowing really what you're coming to and some of you probably having expectations or ideas about what this might mean or some of you already working with this as a principle of personal work, spiritual work, or psychological work. So I welcome you for whatever reason you came. And um, I'd like you to simply just be aware that we're not isolated completely in our own homes or bedrooms or offices or whatever. We really are in a potential work chamber, we might say. And uh, a work chamber is created when a group of individuals come together with a similar intention. So even though I won't take the time for everybody to articulate their, that intention, I'm going to assume on your part that you came because there's something here that you would like to work with for your own benefit and for the benefit of humanity or creation. And uh, assuming that very generic intention, call upon our own deep inner resources, the inner resources of all those who are present now on this call, and also the awareness for most of you who come onto this call. I assume that you have some kind of a, a spiritual or philosophical path that you're walking, and that we can invoke the presence or the, the force, the power of, uh, that, of something greater a life force that connects all of us. Just for a moment to be present to the fact that you are embodied, that you have a body right here, and perhaps just take a moment to be present to your breath, and then to be present to the fact that there are others who are here with you, and to possibly create the intention that all of us on this, in this meeting may benefit from consideration together. My own path, my, my lineage, my teacher, Lee Lazowick, his guru, Yogyakarta Sarat Kumar, and a vast array of spiritual friends and resources that I have been feeding from for many, many, many years of my life. I come from a very Christian, Catholic, contemplative tradition. I've been immersed in a Hindu form for many years, so I'm happy to be with you all. One of the things that I'm doing right now as a book editor is I'm editing a book with the book title called Not What Should Be, But What Is. That comes from a Bengali Hindu master who attracted a very small following of Westerners over the course of a number of years in the 1960s. And the followers who he attracted happened to be French, a group of very intellectual French seekers, one of whom was a man by the name of Arnaud Desjardins, who um, is a contemporary. He's passed away in 2011, but he's a contemporary spiritual luminary. And Swamiji Prajnanpad is the man who was this Bengali guru. So Prajnanpad was not some farmer. He was a highly intellectual, highly educated man who had studied intensely in many different disciplines, including Freudian psychotherapy. He had a unique way of working with people, 
And he also invented a type of psychotherapy that he ended up calling lyings in English because in order to undergo this therapy, you would lie down and the therapist would sit at your head invoking the presence of um, the guru's lineage so that they were holding a space of a sacred chamber with you. And you would do a lot of deep connection to, to physical bodily sensations connected with memories. And you would be allowed to cathartically express your emotions in that very limited space. So this was called lyings. Very, very powerful process, which I've had the experience of of being coached in. I went through a series of lines at a time in my life when I needed help. It was profound. So this uh, Swami Prajnan Pod was, was an amazing human being and was able to synthesize for Westerners a type of approach to spiritual work that I find to be incredibly refreshing and also very radical in the way in which he would word things. So uh, he has a whole series of what Arnaud came to call formulas. These were the things that Arnaud wrote down when he was at Swamiji's ashram in, um, in Bengal for the years that he was there. And Arnaud had many interviews with him and wrote down these little, what they call formulas. So just to give you an idea of how radical Prajnan Pad's languaging was and his approach to spiritual the spiritual work, he has such formulas as never believe a thought associated with an emotion. Now, what you have to understand from Prajnanpad is that for him, there was a very great distinction between emotion and feeling. He was not saying never have emotions. He was not saying emotions are bad. But he was pointing to something very core to the work on the spiritual path. Until we know the workings of our own mind and emotions, there's no way to move into a more absolute dimension. We're always being held back by the mind and by our emotional reactivity. So his recommendation in that formula was never believe a thought associated with an emotion. So emotions are reactions. They're what arises when we are triggered in some way. And emotions can be enthusiastic emotions as well as very negative emotions like anger. So he's also talking about this rush of enthusiastic, wow, that you're going to go, you know, running after some some new flame or some some new uh, piece of furniture or whatever, you know. So uh, it's also about the anger. It's also about the resentment. It's also about the guilt. It's also about the sadness. These are not bad at all. He's simply saying, do not get hooked up into it, starting a whole mentalization about something that's simply an arising in the, in the environment. Feelings, on the other hand, are quite different. Feelings arise in us when the, quote, we or the I or the ego is not in control. So there is a type of sentimental sadness that we, we all experience in certain situations because, oh, I, was, I loved that person so much or I was so attached. And then there is an unwordable arising of a sensation, which we can call grief which sometimes causes the whole body to just, you know, lose its orientation (laughs) momentarily. Or it causes tears to arise spontaneously. And there's not even a thought necessarily attached to that arising. It's just that wave of a spontaneous, non-egoic-centered emotionality that, we, that is not emotionality, but it's feeling, it's the feeling sense. And Prajnan Pad, as in the Gurdjieff work, called this higher emotional center or the feelings, the feeling centers. So it was, it's very important as I continue on with this talk, because when I talk about not what should be, but what is, the, the, the correlation between emotion and feeling and what that connection, that identification with, with emotion does to the thinking and how we create suffering for ourselves based on that identification with 
emotions and the thoughts attached to emotions. It's very, very important to get those distinctions. So you may have gotten it at a level that you don't even necessarily comprehend at this point. You just know there's a difference between these two. That's enough for now. You don't have to actually be able to define it to somebody else. But just get a felt sense that we're not talking about ordinary emotionality. We're talking about the possibility of an organic bodily arising of something which which Prajnanpa distinguished as higher emotional or feeling centers. So that's where this quote comes from. Because not what should be, but what is, is at the core of Prajnanpada's teaching as well. And what he claims, and I think we'll see as we go on tonight, he claims that it is the, it, the grasping on to what should be and what shouldn't be, that is the cause of our suffering. And when we hold on to something with the context or the picture frame around it, this shouldn't be, then what we're doing is we're expending a huge amount of life energy, uh, energy drain for us. So not what should be, but what is, is the subject of our talk tonight. I want to begin reading a poem for you from one of my mentors. Uh, Because what you're going to find, and for those of you who are on different paths, you'll find that this teaching is core in so many of them. In in Christianity, it's there. Have no thought for tomorrow. Your heavenly father feeds the birds of the air. You You can't change what is. So it's deep in Christianity. And it's deep in the work of the Gurdjieff traditions. It's deep in many philosophical systems also. So here's my friend Red Hawk, who has been a mentor coach for me for for many years now. And some of you know his book called Self-Observation, The Awakening of Conscience, an owner's manual. And here's the poem that is the whole talk, really. The poem is called So What? Your dog disappeared and never came back. So what? Your neighbor encroached on your property and refused to correct it. So what? Your parents didn't love you. So what? You caught your maid in bed with your best friend. So what? Your husband died of a heart attack and you've been told you have three weeks to live. So what? We are all born to die. So what? The human race is on the verge of extinction. So what? The atomic bombs are all in the hands of lunatics. So what? Everything is what it is, exactly as it is. All meaning and all suffering derive from judging it good or bad which is arbitrary, subjective, relative, and meaningless. You completely and vehemently disagree? So what? So I begin with that poem, first of all, to honor Red Hawk and the mentorship that I've felt from him over many years and the work of his book, because it is confrontive. It's terrible. You know, uh, to sound so unsympathetic. And um, he's certainly not like this in his, in his personal interactions. But when he's writing the truth of poetry for himself, he's going to put it down in a way that can ignite something for us. And when he gets to the part where he says, everything just is what it is, exactly as it is, all meaning and all suffering derive from judging it good or bad, which is arbitrary, subjective, relative. You completely disagree, so what? If objections and disagreements are arising in you, this is good. So we'll take care of some of those as questions as we go on this evening. So thank you for just being with that. If a mental disagreement arises for you, the recommendation is that you might just check in with your body and see where that is in the body. 
and where and what it is doing in your body. If you say, that's bullshit, I hate that. Okay, feel what gets triggered, where in the body that gets triggered and what is the sensation that it is to have that. The second piece I want to read is from my own spiritual teacher, Lee Lazowick. And it's from a book called uh, Just This 365, which is Wisdom and Wit from the Teachings of Lee Lazowick. And this is number one called Just This. It's exactly the same teaching, not what should be, but what is. The phrase is just this. Just what? Just this. What's this? This is whatever is, as it is, here and now, just means nothing else, no options, no alternatives, just this. What does that mean? It means that in reality, in fact, there isn't anything except just this. This is the seed essence, the core of my whole teaching. What just this actually defines, what it is, is very powerful medicine to combat the sickness of separation, duality, and illusion. Just this means no past, no future, nothing else, just this. So um, any of us who've been doing any kind of reading in the, in the realm of spirituality or psychology, uh, we've all heard the statement, you know, just be here now. And I see, I've seen guys, you know, working in construction sites with, with T-shirts on that say, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> that's, that's the T-shirt. It's, it is what it is, you know, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> And it's really very profound wisdom. Because when you say just this, or when you say it is what it is, it does not mean that then you go home and crawl in the couch, on the couch and cover your head and stay there. It actually means, from the way in which I'm attempting to work with it now, that the more present you can actually be to what is, the more inner resources the more of an inner spine, you know, the inner, inner backbone, the inner energy you have to take that next step into what is. This is not a nihilistic philosophy, which means you don't do anything. It's an approach to actually staying with deep presence and attention in the here and now. And I think that's what Lee is pointing to when he talks about how when you use the practice just this, you're actually combating the whole notion of separation. Because what is separation? It's, it's, it's everything from, from putting myself against another. It's a, a sense of putting myself outside of the natural world and saying that rain shouldn't be. I'm separating myself from the organic rain, from the, you know, from the flow of nature in this moment. It's a cause of separation between me and the world at large. Anytime I do that, so he's saying it actually hits at the way in which we separate ourselves from each other. So you shouldn't say that, I might say to somebody or a child. <laughs> And as soon as I say, you shouldn't say that, I've already created, I've already intensified the separation between us. Not what should be, but what is. So it becomes what shouldn't be. This shouldn't be. So Lee's saying it brings about duality, brings about illusion. And the illusion that he's referring to is that we could actually live in my world rather than the world. So this teacher, Prajnanpad, once gave Arno a very profound teaching. 
Arnaud came back and uh, had visited this wonderful female saint named Anandamai Ma in India. And he was talking to Prajnanpat about Anandamai Ma. And he spent a good deal of time with her. He, he even made a documentary film about her. And Prajnanpat looked at him and said, Arnaud, you have never met Anandamai Ma. And Arnaud was, what, what could that possibly mean? And Prajnanpat went on to say to him, you have never met Anandamai Ma. You have met your Anandamai Ma. You have never met Anandamai Ma. What you have met is someone on whom you have overlaid so many ideas and projections and want to be and should be. And, oh, isn't it great? And everything that you have met with her, everything you've been with her has been filtered through how you want her to show up, what you expect from her, what you want her to be, who you think she is, who you think she should be. You have never met Anandamai Ma. You've met her with the emotions. You've met her with the thinking, analytical mind. You haven't met her as just pure presence. You haven't met her in the body as just pure attention and pure presence. So I'll say a few more things and then I'm going to open for questions because hopefully we've aroused a few interesting possibilities here for, for going deeper. To make it very, very, very concrete is um, another piece that I received from Red Hawk. He, uh, he gives us various exercises to work with during the week or the month or whatever we're working with him. And the very first exercise he gives people is don't complain and don't interrupt and don't interfere. I mean, that's a lot to even try and do in one day, no less, you know, uh, all three of them. So what we've done in some of our practices in the groups that I've been facilitating is we just take one of them. So we just work with, let's not complain, let's, or at least let's watch, you know, because you don't want to like, I'm not going to complain and then be tense all week. Could we possibly observe ourselves when we are complaining? Could we possibly observe how much complaining we actually do? And that doesn't mean just verbalized. Huge amounts of complaining is, is vocalized, is verbalized, is shared. Is, because it's, it's, the, it's what used to happen around the water cooler when people went to offices, you know, or in the lunchroom, or what the teachers do at, at, on the break, you know. It's all complaining about the administration or the kids or the parents or the homework or whatever. And this is, this is also, you know, it, it, it greases the wheels of human relationship. And it's incredibly tiring. And you know that. You know, sometimes you've left a situation with a group of people just talking and you go, oh, I'm exhausted. And if you look at why, you'll see that so much of the conversation is nothing but complaint. Complaint is a form of, this shouldn't be. Those parents should be better. They should not do this. The kids should do this. The other teachers, the administration, the homework, this should not be. But it is. And so watching those kind of external complaints, but then there's the internal complaint. That's really one to, to really work at because that's why we call it so, the practice of self-observation. Because as you're going through your day, you continuously tune in and say, okay, where's my, where's my thinking right now? Where's the thinking happening? And I don't know what you'll find or what you've found in your own work with this, but what I find is it's, it's fairly constant. Fairly constant. It's an internal... It's an internal chattering, an internal blah, blah, blah of comparison, contrast. This would be better if, I wish it were, if only, um, too bad that we had to. It's, it's fairly constant. And if that kind of external complaint sharing is tiring to our, to our physical and emotional, psychological bodies and well-being, 
it's only just increased and exacerbated by the internal complaint. It's, it's constant. And I'm, it's not bad. You know, it's just what is. Because that's not what should be, but what is. So that is what is. But if we're going to make use of this material as food for the inner, inner being, to build being, which is, I think, what we're about, we would like to build a being, then the qualities of being are presence and attention. And one of the ways in which we build presence and attention is becoming aware of how things are, of what is. And the what is, is that my internal complaining, my external complaining, are draining my life force and keeping me from being present to what is. So if I'm walking down the road and I'm complaining so internally to myself, because it's rutted or has a lot of rocks on it, and I could break my ankle and blah, blah, you know, uh, how much am I missing with that internalization? I'm missing that bird, that incredible bluebird that landed on the, on the dead tree this morning. It's unbelievable, the color of it or the, the aroma of that chaparral that I smelled that day, you know, whatever. So what we have, we have uh, things that we call problems, and that's what we complain about, as well as things that are just minor annoyances. But the ones we want to call problems uh, is the big ones that we complain about. And the reason they're problems is because the picture frame around them is this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be. So what's the picture frame? The picture frame to change is not into this should be, this should be, this should be, this should be, be, because it it shouldn't. It's just what is. The picture frame around it is life is full of problems. (laughs) Welcome to reality. This is what goes on every day. The Buddhists call it dukkha, that ongoing itch of dissatisfaction. (laughs) That's the way, that's what happens in the world. That's why the Buddha said all life is suffering. He said it because things don't work out the way I think they should. The world is not working the way I would run the world if I could have everybody do exactly what I said at every second. No, it's not what it should be. It's what it is. And life is full of it. Welcome to dukkha. Welcome to life on this plane of incarnation. This is not the heaven realm. This is a realm of, in which duality is always at play, light and darkness. We're not looking to try and make everything light and airy and wonderful. We're actually looking at reality. This is what is. And we're attempting to bring ourselves into a sense of how, how silly it is that I go around telling the rain that it shouldn't be or telling the, the dryness of Paulden or the wind of Paulden. You should not be, you know. You should be like Santa Barbara or whatever other place, you know, whatever place I fantasize that I, that's the most perfect environment. <laughs> So we're talking about the energetic cost of going around in a problem mind, a complaint mind, and making our personal relationships about that. My dearly beloved husband, Jerry, when we moved to Paulden, he made me promise one thing. He didn't make me. He just suggested that, we, that I promise something. And he said, if we're going to move to Paulden, I don't want to complain ever about the weather. Well, he knew me well enough to know that that would be a really hard piece of work for me. But he was like that. He would, you never know, so you might as well worry about it. Which was my tendency to speculate about the future and then create a whole series of complaints and problems and ideas about what that could be like if and when it happened. So he was, he was playing with me. 
You never can tell. That could happen. You might as well start worrying about it now. So these teachings come back to me very strongly when I observe myself as I do every day in some form of complaint, problem, what should be, what shouldn't be. I'll end for a moment here just by reading a little bit directly from Prajnanpad. Uh, and by the way, this book will be published by Home Press and it'll be available by next June. It's taking a long time to do the translations and so on. But uh, please look for it at your local bookstore. Here it comes. Not what should be what what is. He says, look into yourself and around you. Everywhere there is confusion, disorder, suffering, conflict. The evil one, capitals with, with quotes around it, the evil one, is working for denial. Is working for this should not be. Is working for I refuse that what is is. And it is this evil one or this mind that cuts you off from the reality of the phenomenal world. If you are not even in a direct relationship with the phenomenal world, with relative reality, how can you pretend to be in relationship with absolute truth? The principle that must always guide you is this one. Not what should be, but what is. And only what is in the relative can lead you to what is in the absolute. There is no other way. The mind will never stop creating for you a parallel world to the real world. It will never stop comparing the real world to its own world and then accepting or refusing the real world according to its conformity to that illusory world of its own making. Mind works this way, always creating two. How do you expect, if you live this way, not to suffer? Suffering only comes from this creation of a second by the mind. If you live in a single world rather than two worlds at once, you will not suffer. Suffering is only made of this vain and false comparison. And still, you give the same importance to these two worlds. But what is really insane is that the mind considers the world of its own manufacturing to be the real one. In order to come back to the real world, one first needs to make an about face. To recognize that it is this world which is real and not the one in your mind. Then, where there were two, there will be only one. This inner about face consists of not giving the primacy anymore to your illusory world, but to the real one. What you can do from morning till night Whatsoever the conditions and circumstances may be, with no exception, is to bring the two back to one. It is minute by minute in the small daily details of existence that the game is won or lost. All circumstances, even the most ordinary ones, the most humble, are immense, immense possibilities for one who is engaged on the path. No, oh, I have I have plenty more of his stuff to read or talk about, but you can just take so much. It's so for me, it's so dense. It's like eating, you know, what's that German chocolate cake? <laughs> I have to take a few bites at a time. So I'm happy to entertain uh, comments, questions, confusions, doubts, disagreements, despair, denial. Hi. But I do have a question. Um, it's been my experience personally that what happens to me in this material plane or whatever you want to call it, I just see it as 
a blending, a merging with the shadow side, but an acceptance of those things that you might not be willing to accept, but as you do, you become more aware and more integrated with the quote unquote world. What do you think of that? This is a very profound and, and deep teaching. To look at what is, is actually to actually have the shadow side present, have that access to both light and shadow. You, you see what's going on. You see the activities that are going on. You can call something as murder or rape or, or destruction of the earth. You're actually in touch with it. You're being present to what, to what is rather than overlaying this, this thing of, of your, own, your own judgmental, moralistic sense of what is. So you can see something as it is without having to have a, a moralistic, this is good, this is bad about it. You can just be, with, be present to it and then, then respond out of, that, out of that sense of awareness and presence. Exactly. Thank you. It's a very wide view. You're, you're looking at what is in the fullest sense because a lot of, I think from my own experience, a lot of my own personal pain and suffering has been because I did not want to see what is. I did not want to see both the light and the shadow present in something. How, how would you advise people to go about accepting the broader perspective? You know, I can only just rely upon what I've, what I've given you from, from these, uh, these teachings. And, and the first step is always to become aware of what it is I'm doing. You don't want to have people change anything. You simply want to invite yourself and others to become aware of what we are doing. Because out of that awareness comes a, a possibility for some, some kind of movement or organic an organic movement. So what he's recommending is, you know, until you're able to see how you're doing this time after time without judgment, that's, that's the trick to recommend to, to, to one another and to myself is, can I keep watching myself do this complaining and probleming and complaining and probleming and overlay and overlay, but just keep watching that I'm doing this to reality. I'm just trying to create my world rather than just the what is world. And as I see that, that, op- that sets me a foundation on which something else could possibly emerge. So your question is, how do you, you know, direct or get or assist? It's only by developing through self-observation some kind of awareness that that's what I am doing. Until you get to, until you get to see it, they say, you know, until the... The alcoholic hits bottom. They're not going to. There's not not going to be a change possible. So we have to be able to see it all the time, and then and be with it. And that's what creates the possibility for change. I have to reinforce for this group that's listening to me. I'm not speaking these things because I have mastered them. I'm speaking them because I'm deeply involved in this process with you. For those of you who are in this type of process. I'm really actively working at this in my own life, not because I have mastered it or am beyond it. So I don't necessarily have answers to your questions. I have some good resources and I am using myself to attempt to verify that. So please know that that's where I'm coming from. You know, you can't verify it for yourself and do not suffer. (laughs) Thank you, Regina. Welcome. One of the areas that you mentioned, three things to not do. And I wrote down two, but I didn't get the other one. Don't complain. Don't interrupt. And don't interfere. Oh, don't interfere. We keep trying to fix things. We're complaining, we're interrupting, and then we're trying to fix, you know, interfering. So he's certainly not talking about don't interfere if you see somebody, you know, beating beating a person in a parking lot, you know, call the police or whatever you do. You know, that's not the interference he's talking about. He's talking about that kind of internal and external interfering the way in which we're always trying to fix 
and change something because we it doesn't suit our world. I was very happy and surprised when you said we're here to build a being. I find that very interesting. But in, in my history, I've been familiar with the world of meditation. And I, I find myself now being interested in prayer. It seems to me with your topic that we want to get rid of wishful prayer or intercessory prayer. And, and so what might prayer look like? with that surrender to what is, would be, I think, one of my questions. And the interest that I had in we're here to build a being, you know, my strategy for the good half of my journey was really to get out of Dodge into divine space, not to be here, and discover and explore what it is to be a true human being. So that's why I found building a being very compelling. It's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? I, I, I like that phrase. I don't, I don't use the phrase building a being, but I use the phrase building being, like being presence, being attention. Like you have met people in your life where you say, that person has a sense of being, you know? Um, I have I have met people in my life who I, I didn't even talk to a whole lot, but the way in which they presence themselves, they they exude a type of beingness, being presence. They're not easily drawn into um, a lot of personality type fluff. They they sort of stand with dignity and integrity and and power and strength but not based on, on power over, but because they are, they are grounded in a, in a certain power in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's the sense in which I'm using being. And I, I love that phrase too. And as far as prayer, I don't know whether, how to answer you, but I'm going to try. And then maybe somebody else has a better answer. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not down on intercessory prayer at all. I used to be. When I first wrote the book, when I wrote my first the first edition of Praying Dangerously, I actually was a little bit down on intercessory prayer. I was much more into into completely, you know, just not my will, but thine be done and the whole nine yards. Not using prayer the way people use Santa Claus, you know, to beg God for things or to ask for things. But I've changed a lot. And by the time the second edition of the book came out, I make that I make that distinction. I say that it's um, for myself. I came around with that. First of all, it's not the only type of prayer that I use, but it is it is organic to me as a human being to have a cry of the heart. So, if you want to talk about the difference between emotion and feeling, the feeling that I think Arno is talking about is the way in which my heart breaks when I see a certain type of situation going on or the way in which my grief has developed since the the illness and death of my husband. So out of that deep inner heart cry, cry of the heart, it's it's a sense of longing. I have gone, bowed down and begged on behalf of the world. And on behalf of suffering other, all the other women in the, in, in the world who are suffering the death of their husbands. You know, I've aligned myself with them and I've begged God's blessing that I be, may be receiving courage and strength and clarity in the way on which I am continuing. So I have begged for things. So in that way, uh, I, am, I am practicing a type of intercessory prayer, which I don't think has to do with coming out of the sense of my world. I don't pray for I don't pray for a new car or I don't pray for to win the lottery, but I, I do pray for the relief of suffering because I'm aligning myself with what I think is the compassionate heart of the of divinity. And I'm crying out really as a form of praise. It's a form of 
of prayer and begging, but it's also a form of praise, I think, to say, your, your people are suffering. Come to our assistance. I think that's what the Psalms were in the, in the Old Testament. They were cries of the heart to the divine. So I'm not opposed at all anymore to that type of intercessory prayer. And I think it aligns with uh, being with what is. The, the more deeply I am with what is, without some kind of mentalized, spiritual, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's all God's will, so, you know, it's all going to turn out. But the more I deeply feel the suffering of humanity, um, the more I am able, to, I think, to, to pray genuinely from the body rather than just from the mind. Does that, does that address your... Absolutely. I, I love your answer. What, what I hear you saying, actually, to tie into my earlier thing is when I feel that impulse for the kind of prayer that you were describing, that brings an ontological depth or, or being. It's like, it's like I'm relating from a deeper place. And it's not about getting a result, but just expressing that so thank you for your answer it was very beautiful oh thank you uh you know i'm reminded of 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 jesus on the cross crying out father forgive them for they know not what they do that's an intercessory prayer you know really and where it comes from is is such a profound place the great mahasiddhi yogi ram surat kumar who i wrote a biography about his he died in 2001, but his um, his ashram in India is still a great a great source of power and prayer. And the woman who is his who was his very close assistant and his servant, really his he called her or his divine slave. She was his attendant for many years, and she has recently been speaking to some of us, and she's just been saying, you know, she's in India. And you know, we think we have some troubles here as far as being isolated in COVID and what we have to experience, but she's got a lot more uh, in her face there. And she's saying to us, basically, she's saying, go to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar, beg him, you know, to relieve the world, you know, beg him. He is powerful. God is all powerful. Be a human being, you know, cry out to the divine for what is wanted and needed in this world. It's really okay. In fact, it's to be treasured. So um, I'm, I'm following that as much as I can. So, Well, I, I wanted to say something about this wonderful question of prayer. It's a very important question. And so I, I, I had two things I wanted to mention um, adding to this consideration. One is in Mr. Lee's school. The name of Yogi Ram Sarakumar is an, a blanket prayer. It is my main way of praying now. The name of Yogi Ram Sarakumar, I say it over my food. I say it as a blessing. I say it as intercessory. Whenever a, a, a situation arises where prayer is appropriate, I simply say Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. So that's one kind of prayer, and it covers everything in my life. That's that's just so it's one of the names of God. So whatever school you're in, if 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 your lineage was a God man or a God woman, that name becomes a, a one of the names of God and is prayer. The other thing is, when my effort is to be present in the body, to shift my attention and focus on the body sensation and the presence in the present, that's prayer without words. The moment I'm present, I am prayer. That's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of service. It's a prayer of sacrifice, and it has no words. It's simply, I am available. I am, and I am available. 
So it's prayer without words. And really, that's, that's all I have to say. I love your discussion so much, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. So just a, a quick comment. When I first went to India, traveling all around to meet these great saints, I was a tear of anomaly to visit Ramana Maharshi's ashram. And I didn't quite know at that time uh, Lee's relationship with Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. But I heard about this ashram, and I found myself walking to this ashram with about 30 young schoolgirls, all dressed in green, and just the simplicity and purity of their life. And we went into the hall, and Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar came in, and we just chanted, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. And that was a field trip. That was, a, that was what people did at Tirvanamali as a field trip. You know, in Dubuque, as a kid, I might go to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And there was, I had no greater experience or impression on that first trip to India than I did going and chanting his name with those schoolgirls. Well, I was going to ask if you would say something about working with strong energies that come up in relating to injustice and inequality in the world, or just in, the, in our personal lives and relating to others who we have uh, disagreements with. Yeah. I mean, because like we can hear this, these ideas and then to actually translate them into life itself it is, you know, bringing it into the body. Anything that you would say about that? Yeah, well, what I, what I can say a little bit, and then maybe other people will have a little bit to say. But let's, let's be very clear when you're talking about this. What do we really know? We know from not only from this discussion, but from our own life experience. We know that strong reactivity to heavy, react, to heavy situations doesn't necessarily further our own work with ourselves. Okay, so I'll, I'll personalize that. My own reactivity it actually um, diminishes my ability to actually make any difference, to be present to the to the situation of the world, to the violence, to you know the injustice, and so on. If I'm if I'm responding, if I'm reacting through mentalizations and through strong emotions and through hab habitual patterns, then I'm not really necessarily making any real difference, and I'm certainly not feeding the being of myself. The thing I need to do and the thing that I think Arno was talking about, Red Hawk's books are all about, is that when we are faced with, with these kinds of situations, that these are possible food to, that we can use to feed the being if we can learn how to digest them or if the body itself will digest them. So in the presence of this kind of situation, we can, we can enter into the body and we can observe in the body what is happening. And as we observe the strength of the emotions that are arising and as we observe the reactivities, you know, the heat and all of that, we can be with our breath also. One of our No and Prajnanpad's primary teachings is become one with emotion. And out of that, comes the possibility of resting in being because we're constantly so separate. We have the mind fighting against the body and reality fighting against our view of what things should be. And he's suggesting that if you will, are willing to really let yourself observe by sensation what these arisings are and actually deepen your resting in them, like just letting them be, letting them arise with your breath as you're with the sensation. That becoming one with is the way in which one comes back to 
presence and attention such that one is then able to move from that place to something that might actually make you know a difference for yourself you're feeding the beings so that you yourself then have the presence and attention to be be able to do what's wanted and needed in the moment it seems like that involves being the word observing sounds a little bit removed from an experience of like heat that yeah. is a word that you use it's not about suppression it's about being with really strong emotions and being able to um, tolerate or relate with yes. ex- experience that fully yes. which i've heard <laughs> can be transformation yes <laughs> My sense is that we have to be very, very careful about how we observe our own reactivity because speaking for myself, there's a lot of passion sometimes when we are looking at what's going on in the world, the violence, the injustice, the mind-blowing injustice of what we witness every single day and there's reactivity. For me, I have found that it's very helpful to um, have compassion for myself. And yes, there needs to be a management of the mind. There needs to be vigilance and self-observation. But sometimes I find that if I just follow the thread of that reactivity, if I follow it, if I stay with it, and I stay with my breath, I think breath plays a big part in being able to follow the thread of, of reactivity So if we're talking about like emotional reactivity and all the passion that's in that, if we stay with it, if we stay with the breath, I think it could lead to a place of genuine feeling. I think that is possible where, you know, maybe that feeling is um, just heartbreak. And out of that heartbreak comes a prayer naturally arises just a prayer that's an expression of the heartbreaking in response to um, what's going on. And so I, I think we just have to be careful not to be too, you know, oh my God, this is, this is reactivity. This is reactivity. I think we need to have compassion for ourselves and we need to follow it and see where it takes us because it can take us to a much deeper place. Mm-hmm. I think it's possible. Thank you very much. I think that we had a, a real example of a, a moment of vulnerability to uh, to be here and to be, to be present, is to be vulnerable in that moment to whatever is, you know, to be uh, uh, transparent to that over and over and over again. So I think it was a great object lesson. Thank you <laughs> for making that available. Um, all of you. Appreciate it. I just want to say it's remarkable to feel the living current among you. And I, I thank you for being witness to my own process of working with these teachings. I thank you for what you've shared and for giving me the opportunity to share our nose work and Lee's work and to have been here and to facilitate this discussion.